Okay, so this is uh, the second hour of Physics 1B for September 28th, and keeping with uh, our order here, the next thing we're talking about are equations of state, and specifically we're going to look at the ideal gas equation as an example of that. So what's an equation of state? So an equation of state is... Um, I, I, I compare it to something in physics. It's like an equation of motion in physics 1A. In physics 1A, you talk about like projectiles, and you say, if I know where a projectile is, and I know what its velocity is, I can predict for you exactly where it's going to be in the future. Right? That's an example of an equation of motion. An equation of state is something similar, but it's applied to a gas. A gas is a little more complicated in the sense that um, it's full of a whole lot of particles um, that are often combined in some kind of container like this. Um, and if we wanted to describe the motion of every single one of those particles, that would be impossible and would ultimately be kind of meaningless. Um, what we want to know about a gas often is just some what are called state variables. And those state variables are the pressure of the gas, the volume of the gas, the temperature of the gas, and the number of moles of the gas. Those are called uh, state variables, P, V, T, and N. Your textbook likes to use little p for pressure. I think that's pretty consistent with a lot of physics textbooks, although it's, it's a little confusing because we used p for momentum. Uh, but, uh, you know, just, you know, kind of try to get used to that. This p represents pressure. Um, and for an equation of state, we just want to relate those variables to each other. It's, it's really that simple. Um, and, you know, this equation here is an example of a type of equation of state. And contained within it are some things we've already learned about. So in the previous chapter, we learned about this term right here. Okay. If you look at just that portion of the equation that I have boxed in, and I think I can make this a little bit bigger here. So if we look just at that portion of the equation that's boxed in right here, um, it says that the, the volume of an object when subjected to a temperature change is equal to the initial volume times 1 plus beta times t minus t naught. This is what we were talking about last Monday. The idea that if you subject um, a, a liquid or a gas to, uh, and also metals to, um, some kind of a temperature change, you can you can figure out the volume change by looking up this this letter beta, which was the coefficient of volume expansion, and we said it was equal to three times the linear uh, expansion coefficient. Okay, so that's what that portion says. In addition, you have another term that's in here, which is k times p minus p naught. Now this tells you how the volume changes when the pressure changes. And this is something that comes from chapter 11 in your textbook, which is something that you know, a, a lot of Physics 1A instructors just skip, including me usually. Um, but it's uh, something that tells you how when an object is subjected to, to a pressure change, the volume can also change. Um, now, this is an example of some type of a device that could be used to both measure as well as alter any of these state variables. And the way it would work is you could you could heat the gas up with a torch. You could measure the temperature here then with the temperature T. Um, you could have a piston down here that you could either fix in place or you could allow it to move that can make uh, give you the ability to change the volume in the chamber. And then you can also have some kind of a pump to pump in additional gas molecules. Now, this type of a device, um, you can use it to determine some really simple things about gases that are, are listed below. Um, such as the fact that if I if I heat the temperature up, but I hold the volume constant, what happens to the pressure? I'll ask it again. If I heat this system up, but I hold the volume constant, what's going to happen to the pressure? Increase, right? What happens if I uh, allow the piston to move, and then I heat it up? What happens to the volume? The volume would increase, right? And what would happen to the pressure? I don't know. We can we can figure it out. Um, so oh, we were going to talk about what? Well, okay, remind me to talk about the greenhouse effect later. <laughs> we were going to do that. So uh, here, let's reset this. 
So uh, FET, this website that we use to do a lot of these demos, has a nice little demonstration. It's basically the exact same thing in that picture right there. Um, and this one, you can measure pressure, you can measure temperature, and we have a pump via which we can pump in gas molecules. So let's pump some gas molecules in here. You can see as we pump more and more molecules in here, the pressure increases. That should be reasonable. If I have more gas to deal with, the pressure should go up. The pressure will kind of fix at some value right here. It takes a little bit of time, but eventually it'll kind of settle out. Okay, so what can we do with this? Well, we can we can close the volume off. Um, we can look at what happens to pressure and temperature if we do that. So this one up, looks like the temperature maintained the same temperature. If we make it bigger, the pressure will come back down. Uh, we can also heat it up a little bit. Both temperature and pressure increase then. And this is set up so that if it gets too hot, and the pressure gets too high, well, maybe it won't happen. Before class, I was messing with this, and eventually when the pressure got too high, the lid blew off the top. But maybe I just had too many molecules in there. Yep, there it goes. So we've lost some of our molecules now, so the pressure probably decreased a little bit. Um, I think if you do this, I wonder if you do volume constant. I wonder if the lid can still come off if you do that. Ah, oh, there we go. So this is holding pressure constant. And it shows that if we keep the pressure constant, that the volume has to increase and the temperature has to increase to, to kind of deal with that. Uh, we can keep the temperature constant, which means we can't manipulate this right here. But if we keep the temperature constant and we close this off, oh, that doesn't work, does it? Wait, what does this mean? Oh, that's not what I thought it meant. Sorry, this would be temperature constant, wouldn't it? There we, go. If we keep the temperature constant. Temperature cannot be held constant with the container open. Well, but, but you've made the container open. Here, let's do this real quick. Yeah, so if we keep the uh, the temperature constant, then we can see that only the pressure is going to change and the volume is going to change. Anyway, so this can help us to see a lot of the things that you guys already know, right? If I increase the number of molecules, the pressure is going to go up, right? If we if we decrease the size of the container, yeah. So we're going to come back and we're going to use this to uh, to also talk about energy kinetic energy speed later on. But for now, this is just kind of a nice way to produce a lot of things that you already kind of know about gases. Um, and what do we know about gases? This is what we know right here. These are all things that, because almost everyone in here at some point in time has taken a little bit of chemistry, you probably know all these things, as you, as you just said. Uh, measurements of the behavior of various gases lead to three conclusions. The volume V is proportional to the number of moles. If we double N, keeping pressure and temperature constant, the volume will double. So there's a direct relationship. The volume is inversely uh, varying with the pressure. If we double the pressure while holding the temperature constant, the number of moles constant, the gas will compress to one half its initial volume. If we double the pressure, uh, then uh, it's going to compress to uh, one half its volume. Um, in other words, if P and V are constant, when N and T are constant. Also, the pressure is proportional to the absolute temperature T. If we double the temperature T, uh, keeping volume and number of moles constant, the pressure doubles. So all of these can be summarized in an equation that you're all pretty familiar with, probably, what's called the ideal gas equation. The ideal gas equation relates pressure, volume, and temperature. And it also relates number of moles, which means it is an equation of state. It's an equation of state associated with the gas that can relate whatever the pressure or the volume number of moles and temperature are, to a fixed constant called R, which is known as the gas constant. The value of the gas constant takes on two different values. Um, this one, I believe, in liters times atmospheres divided by mole Kelvin is the one you're probably the most familiar with from chemistry, 0 0.08206. Maybe you even did a lab in chemistry where you measured this. Did you guys do that? Is that something you did in high school or in college where you actually measured this quantity? I'm going to take that as a no. You guys did, did not do that. Maybe Andrew's saying he did. Um, and then the one we'll probably be using most commonly in this class uh, is this one. So I usually just remember it as 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. But uh, yeah, that's the equation. And there are 
two other ways. There's really like there's like there's a bunch of different ways you can write this equation, but there's um, there's two other ways that are going to be valuable to us. So one way is um, the situation where the number of moles is constant. If the number of moles is constant, then the quantity uh, P multiplied by V divided by the temperature, um, this should be equal to R, which is a constant. So if I have a gas and it moves between two states, let's say the pressure, the volume, and temperature change in some way, then we can relate them using this type of an equation. P1 times V1 divided by T1 is equal to P2 uh, times V2 divided by T2. This is a pretty useful way in which we're going to use uh, the ideal gas law. I need to zoom in a little bit because this is not drawing as much as I would like it to. Um, yeah, this is one way we could use this equation. Um, another way that we could use this equation is to note that um, the number of moles of a substance um, is related to um, molar mass. Molar mass is usually, we use the symbol M to represent it. Maybe I could write it with what that is. M is molar mass. It represents the, um, the mass in grams per mole or kilograms per mole. The unit for this is kind of tells you everything you need to know. It's usually kilograms per mole or grams per mole. It tells you the mass per mole. So if I know that it represents mass per mole, then if I take... Um, the number of moles of a gas that I have, and that's going to be equal to the mass, right? If I take molar mass and I multiply by the number of moles, that gives me the mass of the object, right? In this case, a gas. So within our equation up here, we can take PV equals NRT, and we can replace little n with uh, M over M. And then we can divide the volume to the right hand side so that we end up getting pressure is equal to um, mass divided by volume um, times RT divided by molar mass. And then what's mass divided by volume for a substance equal to? Density, yeah. And the symbol we use for density is usually rho, right? So we would get density times r times t divided by the molar mass. This is another form of the ideal gas law that we can use that involves density. And we'll use this one a little bit later on to solve one of the problems as well. So three versions of the ideal gas law. This is the most common one, uh, keeping in mind what the R value is, which is right up here. Can I pull that down? Okay. And then, yeah, there's this version right here where you have, uh, again, the number of moles is constant. We can use this. That's to say if the, the system is remaining closed and nothing's escaping. And then one that relates pressure to density, uh, temperature, and molar mass right here. Okay. So we'll use that to solve, I think, three or four different types of problems. Do you have any questions? I'm curious to make sure I actually wrote that, that I actually did that derivation correctly. I think I did, though. You don't have any questions? Yeah, P equals, no, it's wrong. What did I do wrong? Oh, they solved it for density. Okay, no, it's right, it's right. Okay, no questions? All right, let's do some ideal gas problems then. Oh, there's the equation that I just derived out for you guys. Put a little bit too much spacing between these problems. Okay, well, we're going to go through these relatively quickly, as I suspect most of you have 
seen these things before. Oh, I want to mention one other thing too, which is that temperature always has to be in Kelvin for these, by the way. It always has to be in Kelvin. Let's keep that in mind. So volume of an ideal gas at STP. STP stands for standard temperature and pressure. It says, what is the volume of a container that holds exactly one mole? So the N equals one mole of an ideal gas at a standard temperature and pressure defined as the temperature is just zero degrees Celsius, which is 273. And the pressure is just normal atmospheric pressure, which is 1.013 times 10 to the five Pascals. And we just want to find volume, right? We start from this equation, PV equals NRT. In chemistry, did you guys use capital P or lowercase p, by the way? I always remember capital P for my chemistry classes. I don't know what you guys use nowadays. That's what I thought. So volume in this case is going to be just N times R times T divided by the pressure. Yeah, I don't know what the value of using lowercase p is, but I'm just going to be consistent with the book. So number of moles was one. The R, 8.31 times, nope, there's no times 10 to anything, right? It's just 8.31. And then it's joules per mole Kelvin. Multiply by the temperature, 273. Divide by the pressure. And then we get the volume. Pretty easy calculation, you all can do it if you want. We can check out the units to make sure they make sense too afterwards. So I get 0 0.0224. This would be in meters cubed. Something tells me this is 22.4 liters. Is that what, it's, what, is that what you get if you do it in, in liters? It's 22.4 liters? So I think one meter cubed is a thousand liters or no, no, no. One liter is 0 0.001 meters cubed, right? So I'm pretty sure this is equivalent to 22.4 liters. Maybe you guys can correct me if that's wrong. Cause I, th I think that one liter is equal to, I think that's right. Yeah, it is, because a liter of water is like 0.1 meters cube. 0.1 cubed, which would be that. OK. Um, any questions? This number, I remember being a particular importance that like this, I think that historically, like, I want to say, I don't know. Maybe I was going to say Lavoisier, but I might be wrong about that. Historically, there was uh, some scientists that, that realized that if you look at a mole of um, hydrogen gas and a mole of oxygen ja gas, that they happen to have exactly the same volume at standard temperature and room pressure. So that's uh, that was one of the kind of first things that I believe led to them realizing like how these whole number um, uh, proportions that showed up in chemical reactions were occurring, right? It was because they would take like you know, volumes of gas where they, they knew that um, there was some connection between the volume of gas and the number of molecules as a result of that. Um, anyway, okay, pretty simple. Any questions? What does this mean, by the way? Um, so if you put, if you had a container that was this size and you pumped exactly one mole of gas into it, and you cooled it down to uh, zero degrees Celsius, that this is the pressure that it would exert on its container, right? That's what this says. Um, or that if you, you know, yeah. The reason I mention that is because like, if I take a mole of gas and it's at this temperature, and I don't tell you anything about pressure, any container that I put it into, because it's a gas, it's gonna fill the container, right? Do you all agree with that statement? Any container that you put a gas into, it's going to fill the container. But in order for, for it to have exactly this pressure, 
it has to have exactly this volume, basically. That's there, There's a direct connection between the volume and the pressure, even though any gas will fill its container. Right. Okay, I left, I left way too much room here. Maybe, maybe one or two of these problems will take a little more room to, to, to work out. All right, another ideal gas law problem. Um, all right, compressing gas in an automobile engine. All right, so in an automobile engine, a mixture of air and vaporized gasoline is compressed in the cylinders before being ignited. A typical engine has a compression ratio of 9 to 1. That is, the gas in the cylinders is compressed to one ninth of its original volume. The intake and exhaust valves are closed during the compression, so the quantity of gas is constant. So the number of molecules doesn't change. What is the final temperature of the compressed gas if its initial temperature is 27 degrees Celsius and the initial and final pressures are 1 and 21.7 atmospheres, respectively? So we want to find the final temperature. That's our goal. Um, do y'all want to just try this one yourself? Um, for this one, we know that... Um, that N is constant, right? And because that's true, that allows us to use the equation where we relate the initial pressure times the initial volume divided by the initial temperature and say that that should be equal to the final temperature times the final volume divided by the final temperature. And we're looking for what T2 is basically. What is the what is the final temperature of the, of the, uh, the system? Y'all wanna try to just do it yourself? Give you like two or three minutes. Oh, I failed to mention something. And we're going to get into more details about this, but does anyone know why this is called the ideal gas equation? What is it about it that's ideal? Does anyone know? It's not just that it's... Uh, it's supposed to work for really any gas, but it's not, truthfully, doesn't work for any gas. It has to be a gas, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But what what is the perfect part of it? What's perfect about it? Is it? It assumes that its parts are constant. What parts? So, so there's a few assumptions that go into this idea. Disregards entropy. I don't think that's it. That that could be that it could be related to that though. Um, so this equation assumes that the molecules are, on average, very far apart from each other. Okay. Um, and that they don't exert intramolecular forces with each other. Okay. They're very far from each other, so, and, and they also don't exert intramolecular forces, and uh, it assumes that the kinetic energy remains constant, I guess, is probably what you're saying. So yeah, I think that's true. Uh, elastic collisions with the walls, something like that, yeah. In addition, it also assumes that the size of the gas molecules are small relative to the volume of the container. So this equation is not true if we compress all of the gas into a really small volume such that the molecules are close together, because that was one of the assumptions. They have to be far apart. Um, it's also not true if the molecules exert strong forces between one another, such as, for example, in a plasma, where you have electrically charged particles exerting forces with each other. And what's the last part? So it's far apart, they don't exert forces with each other, and the size of the molecule has to be small relative to the volume of the container. That's, I think, uh, no, no. I, you need to be, so it's most valid uh, in, in, in regions of like the phase space where the gas isn't going to phase change, first of all. It's not true across a phase change, right? You can't have the phase change. 
but the pressure and volume and temperature need to be relatively high above the like melting point or the the vaporization point where it would turn into a liquid so yeah but it doesn't it doesn't have to be at standard temperature and pressure for it to be true because we're obviously looking at a problem here where you're going from one atmosphere to 21 at 1.7 atmospheres so it doesn't have to be at stp but i i don't think it would be valid if we want up to for example you know two million atmospheres of pressure at that point it might it might break down okay and we have another equation for that we'll talk about it next it's called the van der waals equation but uh yeah. all right so not true in all situations it is true enough it's good it's it's a good enough equation is what i would say for um um kind of giving you a rough estimate in a lot of situations and it might be off by like you know two percent here five percent there or something like that but but largely it's going to be pretty good pretty good estimate of what you're doing okay all right so i've talked enough not always true but it's it's true enough for for some some small class of problems that that, that matter to us so see if you can solve this one make it a little bit bigger in case you can't read it You have to, yeah, Baron, you've got to put it in Kelvin. That's right. You have to use Kelvin temperature. A really simple example would be, what would happen if you put zero in here? If you put zero Celsius, you get infinity. So and the negative temperatures get even weirder. Okay, that's been about three minutes, so people are getting answers. So let's go ahead. People are saying the answer is uh, 723 Kelvin. Oops. All right, let's see if that's right. Uh, what do we know in this problem? We know that uh, the initial pr pressure P1 was one atmosphere. The pressure 2 was... 21.7 atmospheres. We know that uh, it starts off with some initial volume that we can call V1. 
and its volume V2 is one ninth of that. So I'll just write it like that. Uh, and then we know the initial temperature was 27. That's exactly 300 Kelvin, I think. 27 plus 273, 73 plus 27, yeah, 300 Kelvin. And we want to find T2. So what we get is if we multiply this over here, we would get that T2 should be equal to P1 over P2. Uh, oh, not like that. P2 over P1. Uh, divide by volume 1. So volume 2 divided by volume 1, and then multiply by T1. So T2 should be, did I do that right? Move that over there. Move the P1 down, the B1 down, the T1 over here. Um, so then what's our ratio here? So we get, since these are both in atmospheres and it's a ratio, we don't really need to worry about changing the... Um, unit because the units will just cancel uh, volume 2 is equal to volume 1 divided by 9 so volume 2 divided by volume 1 is 9 right or 1 9 this is 1 over 9 and then t1 was 300 kelvin whatever that is 217 7 plus it's not it I agree with what y'all got, 723 point. I got 723 point whatever. So I'm assuming that, let's see. Maybe you guys, I wonder if, here, let's see what's something. Divide by 300, multiply by 300, 1 to 5. Does that give me the number you got? Yeah. So if we so if we use, so I think what y'all used was 300.15 Kelvin, right? And if we use that number, we'll get the answer you got. Let's do that. Like Kelvin didn't move. You know, in terms of uh, significant figures, I'd probably say that. Well, I guess you'd still use this and just round down, so you would get seven hundred and twenty-three point seven, right? Probably have to round down to 724, though. Okay, that's a, you know, that's your standard uh, ideal gas law problem, right? Um, the next one, boy, I really uh, saved a lot more room than I thought I was going to need here. All right. Anyone have any questions about that one before we move on? Okay, so what's this one? I haven't done any of these problems, by the way. I just I grabbed the example problem from the book. But uh, these are generally not that not that tricky. All right, so mass of air in a scuba tank. In an empty aluminum scuba tank contains eleven liters of air at twenty one degrees Celsius and one atmosphere pressure. When the tank is filled rapidly from a compressor, the air temperature is forty two degrees Celsius and the gauge pressure is 2.1 times 10 to the seventh pascals. What mass of air was added? So it starts off empty. Oh, it's not empty. It has 11 liters of air. Okay, and they give us the molar mass. All right, how should we do this one? What do y'all think? We've got 11 liters of air. So you start off with a tank. Um, I zoom in just a little bit so I can draw a little bit. So you start off with um, 
So this tells us what the volume of the container is, doesn't it? That's not going to change, right? You get a temperature of 21 plus 273, so that would be 294. And the pressure is one atmosphere. What could we use this information to figure out? What could we use this information to figure out? Yeah, right? We can find the number of moles. Do we need to do that? Let's read the problem again. It says, when the tank is filled rapidly from a compressor, the air temperature is this. We're given a second temperature. Uh, 42 plus 273 is going to be, I don't know, 315? Is that right? Um, and the gauge pressure, so the new pressure, which is now in a different unit, is, so gauge pressure means you have to add to this atmospheric pressure, right? And so it would be 2.1 times 10 to the 7. Um, you have to add to this atmospheric pressure, which is about 1 times 10 to the 5. It's like 1.013, but this is 10 to the 7. So our new pressure, pressure 2, is going to be about 2.11. What else do we know? Um, and the volume stays the same though, right? So our goal is to figure out what mass of air was added, right? So how should we go about doing that? How can we find the mass of air that was added? Can we do something like what we did in the previous problem with the ratios? Doing so? So you wanna you wanna do this like Can we do this? We know the volumes are the same. Is this going to tell us what mass of air was added? When is this true? When can, when, when can we use this? Yeah. Is that true here? Yeah, exactly. So this is, we can't really use this in this problem though, basically, right? Unfortunately. Um, maybe, but we're just trying to find how much air was added, right? And you, you guys told me we can, we can solve for this one, right? We can solve for how much moles we started with, right? And then in, in this case, we've, we've added some more moles, right? Now there's, there's more, more little dots of gas in here, right? So you start off with some number of moles in. Over here you have some number of moles that we call in two. So if we know the number of moles here and we know the number of moles here, couldn't we figure out how much we actually added?
by like the difference basically and then if we know the number of moles does that make sense okay let's do that so let's figure out what each of these are you guys why don't Um, we could, yep, but, uh, so, okay, well, let's just write down what you said. Um, so you said you, you want to say V is equal to N times R times T divided by P. Um, so you want to basically set that equal to like N2 R T2 over P. Uh, we could use this to solve, I mean, the problem is here that this is an unknown and this is an unknown. Uh, P, whatever, P2. See the problem? So really, we just want to find M. And we could just say, well, we know PV is equal to NRT. So little n is equal to uh, PV over RT. So we can, we can solve here. These are in liters, atmospheres, and Kelvin. So we could technically use the other version if we want to. So pressure, we leave it as one atmosphere. Uh, volume, we leave as 11 liters. And then divide by... So temperature is 294 Kelvin. Did anyone have any issue with those those Kelvin conversions that I did? Did I get those right? What's the other R? It's like 0. 0.0821. Is that right? I see 0. 0.08 there. 0. 0.0821. Yeah, that's good enough, right? Um, and, ugh, I gotta write the unit in here somehow. Liters times atmospheres divided by mole kel kelvin. God, that looks awful. Let's just let's just not do that. Here's what we'll do. We'll put it at the end. So we're dividing by R times T. So we'll put the temperature first. That's going to be two ninety four. And then R is 0 0.08. Oh god, it looks awful, doesn't it? 0 0.0821. You notice this is like basically the same number as the other one, but the decimals moved over a little bit. Um, and then this is liters atmospheres over mole Kelvin. God, what an awful unit to have to write down. It's just awful. Okay, what do you get if you do this for N? 11 divided by all that junk. Great. Looks like Arlene got the same answer. That unit is going to be moles. We can see it here. Liters, atmospheres, and Kelvin cancel out, and the mole goes to the numerator. Okay. Now we do the same equation, but for N2. Let's write that one down here. So N2 is, again, going to be PV. We'll just we'll start plugging in the numbers. Now here, pressure was given in a different unit, so it was 2.11 times 10 to the 7 pascals. And here I'm just, I'm just using this equation again. We're just reusing this guy. Uh, volume is 11 liters. We need to convert that to meters cubed. I think y'all can go check this for yourselves if you want, but I'm pretty sure that 11 liters is 0 0.011 meters cubed. Um, all right. And then we divide that by R. For this one, we'll use the other version of R, 8.31 uh, joules per mole Kelvin. And then we multiply that by temperature. The new temperature is 315 Kelvin. Does that look right to y'all? The 0 0.011 meters cubed for, for 11 liters? Certainly you guys, or y'all already know this, uh, you can just be like, Type that in, it'll give you the answer. Google's just great like that. Um, all right, what's this equal to? Yeah, I agree. 
But that is a lot, it feels like. That's a lot of moles. So that's also moles. And then as someone mentioned, what we can do to figure out the amount of mass that was added is we can find the number of moles that was added by doing N2 minus N. So if we do that, there's our N2 and there's our N. Then um, we're going to get 88.7 minus this, which is going to be about 88.2. And then to find the mass, we know that it's 28.8 grams per mole. So the mass should be equal to N2 minus N1, or just what we called N, multiplied by the number, get the answer in, in grams, I guess, 28.8 grams per mole. And this gives us whatever that is, 88.2 times 28.8, 2,540 grams, which would be equal to about 2.5 kilograms of air. Okay, you have any questions? This problem's gonna be a little this one's a little trickier, I guess, but at the end of the day you're just using you're just using the ideal gas law equation. Um, yeah. The next one that we're gonna do, which we'll do after the break, I'm gonna pull it up here so you can think about it during the break if you want to, and I'll we'll read it. Um, before do anyone have any questions about this problem? So here's the next one. This is a little tricky. This is going to take us back to some stuff from previous chapters. Um, we want to find the variation of atmospheric pressure with elevation in the Earth's atmosphere. We're going to assume that at all elevations, that the temperature is 0 degrees Celsius, and that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. I pulled in here the two equations we're going to want from this. One equation is this one, which we derived, that relates density to pressure, molar mass, uh, R and T. I th believe for the molar mass here, I'm going to have to look, but I think we're going to use this. Uh, the same molar mass we used from the previous problem, I believe we're going to use in this one. Could be wrong. Um, and then the other thing we need is this equation, which may have shown up in your homework on like one problem and maybe on the lab manual problems as well, uh, where the variation of pressure with depth dp dy, this is the rate at which pressure changes with respect to uh, depth is equal to negative uh, density multiplied by g. We're gonna use this and we're gonna do an integral. And what we're looking for here basically is what is the pressure as a function of the height? That's our goal, to find pressure as a function of height. So that's what we'll do when we come back from break. Um, yeah, if you want to work on it yourself and see if you can work it out, uh, go for it. I uh, will stop the recording now and then we'll come back and we'll talk about this one.